Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for all coming. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, today is one of the first events of seven that we organized for the National Sustainability Living Festival and for M Pavilion. Um, I just want to say a big thank you today for my buddies from Rewilding Stonington Group, <laughs> who actually we had a meeting today and uh, they canceled to come and support me, which is really wonderful. Um, we have great speakers. We have today with us Anthony Dimas from Architect Declare. We have Targol Koram from Architect for Peace. And we have Professor uh, Esther Schaltzworth from Architect Without Frontier. Um, my name is Nadine Samaha, and I'm representing, I'm the chair and the member of the Sustainability, Sustainable Architecture Forum of the Institute of Architects. Before we start, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Waiwurrung, and the Yalukut Willem Bunwurrung as the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today. Wurundjeri, Waiwurrung, and Yaluk Willem Bunwurrung are two of the five major language groups of the greater Kulin nation. We pay our respect to their land, their ancestor, and their elders past, present, and to the future. We also acknowledge the tra traditional custodian of the various lands on which anyone watching a recording of this event watches today. Woman Jika, come with a purpose. So as a member of the Sustainable Architecture Forum in the Institute, we aim to actually share, educate, evaluate our sustainable and principal knowledge, share that with other architects and with the public, and mainly we try to connect people and we promote sustainability practice through um, a multimedia platform, um, mainly connecting as well with the public because sometimes architects can be alienating from the public. Uh, we try to inform and assist as well the Institute with the government and regulation sustainability policies. We are here today, we are facing a pandemic, but it's not the first, there have been much more before. As you know, 60% of human pathogens are zoonotic in origin, so it's very important to understand what is the impact of biodiversity loss, deforestation, loss of natural habitat, and how it affects us. In particular for us as architects, because we are designing uh, the built environment, we need to understand how this can affect and how it can impact on our health and our well-being. As you know, Urbanization gave us cholera. This is because due to um, uh, you know, less sanitization, less hygiene at the time. Deforestation provided us with malaria and so on. So it's really in, very important to understand how ecosystem work, how biodiversity work, and how we as our building and our action, we are affecting the nature around us and what we can do in our built environment. So what we really need to attract, we need to attract more pollinators to create more, to boost biodiversity. This is what we're doing currently in Rewilding Sunnington. We are actually trying to um, strip nature, strip from grass and try to plant more endemic plants to attract again bees and butterflies and create more nests for birds and so on. So it's really trying to do maybe more pocket foresting, doing more uh, green roofing, vertical gardening, really reconnecting with nature and so on. So the best size of the pandemic is basically a waste, as you can see, uh, particularly with masks and gloves and so on. But the silver lining of the pandemic is actually we had a reduction in pollution. And as you can see, the satellite here showing really a drastic reduction in nitrogen dioxide. And this is showing over Italy, so you can see the difference. And we have to understand that nitrogen dioxide, when mixed with air, it actually can affect quite a bit our health. So, yeah, that was the silver lining. We had a little bit of reduction in this and with, you know, with burning fossil fuel. So the question from the National Sustainable Living Festival were two questions. The first one, do we think pandemic created more of a sense of emergency to address climate change and biodiversity? Yes, absolutely. It made us, anyway, in the Sustainable Architecture Forum to accelerate our mission. So what do we do? We, have, we run forums bi-monthly. We have working groups. So we're working on uh, indigenous ecosystem corridors and nodes, on addressing urban sprawl, and providing events. 
we do as well do recommendation for the institute to assist them with, um, we've been assisting them currently with two consultation papers, the Green Wedge and the infrastructure in Victoria. So our bi-monthly meeting, usually we get speakers or we basically just share knowledge and or we share projects, what we're doing and how we're using the best sustainability tools. We run as well with Architect Declare and other organizations and with RMIT and Melbourne Uni, we run like climate action forums. But beyond only like running events and sharing knowledge, we are really understanding now that we are now really on a, just we are really on a level in sustainability and we have to go beyond. So we have to start looking more at regenerative design and really thinking how we can start now restoring ecosystem, restoring nature, regenerate, really thinking about circular economy with material, uh, thinking how we can, maybe material now can maybe clear up pollution, like what they're doing now with concrete and with other material. In a nutshell, regenerative design is a more holistic approach for sustainability. It seeks to understand more the relationship between the ecosystem services and the symbiosis of the environmental, social, and economic uh, impact. Uh, basically, it, it's really aimed to restore rather than really destruct. And the key points to achieve are sequestering reduction of carbon, saving natural habitat, uh, improve biodiversity, and so on. So one of the group is working on indigenous ecosystem corridor and nodes that was initiated by the um, Union Internationale des Architects and the International Federation of Landscape Architects. It landed on our lab um, on SAF. Uh, we've been briefed by Professor Alan Roger in Melbourne Uni and uh, Jane Toner and Peter Malat. And we've been working for nearly a year now, uh, meeting every two weeks. And this, uh, this year in May, we're going to be running workshop and talks about how to boost basically biodiversity and how to address uh, indigenous ecosystem corridor and nodes. So this will be open not only for architects, it will be open as well to the public. And hopefully with time, we'll be working more with, um, with councils um, on really actually taking more action about this and providing more corridors. Uh, the other working group is um, addressing urban sprawl. So we are trying to use 17 United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, uh, working how we can address urban sprawl. So um, this is still in progress, and we meet again um, once a month on this project. I like this, actually, this poster is from Over the Hedge. I'm not sure if you've seen it <laughs> before, but it's actually showing how the settlements start creeping up. And now you will see they are creeping up in green wedges as well in Victoria. And you can see how basically the animals actually fight against the settlements. And this is probably now what we're trying to do as well as architect, trying to um, try to be careful with the creeping and how we can address it. So with events, we, uh, we provide uh, talks like for the Sustainability Festival. Um, we do speed dating as well with architects, with public as well uh, who needs assistance. Uh, we have fun as well going to um, the National Sustainability Living Festival. We are running as well six events for this year for the M Pavilion and the, um, the SLF. So if you go on Eventbrite or any of the other platform, you'll be able to book. Um, so everything that we're doing with addressing urban sprawl and the corridors, like we are already talking on them as well in these uh, webinars or seminars. What lesson from this pandemic can we apply to advocacy and action is keeping accelerating and looking in a different way. So as Edward Wilson said, we are drowning in information but starving for wisdom. So that's what we're doing actually in March. It's our first meeting um, for the forum this year. So we're trying to actually just connect, chill, and uh, just really more think more in a circular way than just like in a linear way and just really connect again with our feelings and where we're going and not just brainstorming and setting goals, but what did we learn, how we reflect on last year and where we're going to go from here. Uh, assisting the Institute, we've been working hard with the Institute and they've been working hard really this week um, to actually address the Green Wedge and Agricultural Land Consultation Paper. So you can see all the green there is actually the, um, the Green Wedge and unfortunately settlements are going to start to creep there. 
So the institute prepared um, a paper to address that and what is the best way to actually be mindful of how development in the future is going to be going there. Um, the issue is the Green Wedge is mainly most of the area which is the bushfire area. So we have to be very mindful. So we are assisting the institute in this because we have really quite good expert in, in um, good expert expert members in the in the forum. And it's not only that as well; it's connecting other people um, to, to come and uh, assist with uh, this consultation paper. Another one we're working on is the Victoria Draft 30 Years Infrastructure Strategy. Um, and hopefully in the future we'll be looking as well at starting a working group regarding affordable housing. As you know, we have a big shortfall of 5,500 affordable rental homes in the city of Melbourne. You never change things by finding the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. This is our motto in the forum, as Buckminster Fuller said. I'll pass you to Anthony Dimas, who's going to be talking more about Architect Claire and their actions. Thank you. OK. Hope you can all hear me. Um, so my name's Anthony Dimase. I'm a, one of the coordinators at Archite uh, Architects Declare. And... Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit briefly about the history of Architects Declare. Um, I won't talk about the declaration per se, but I will talk about, I will um, answer the questions that were given to us in terms of the pandemic and give an overview of where um, we would like to see Architects Declare go in the future. And that's been a hotly debated topic within our group. So uh, these views are my own and they may not end up being views of architects declare but we'll see so for those of you who don't know um, architects declare is a network of architecture practices committing to addressing climate and biodiversity through advocacy and action it started in the UK in May 2019 uh, under a wider banner of construction declares or built environment declares the movement to which I belong has now spread to about 20 countries there are about 5,000 signatories and the idea has been adopted by other disciplines who have signed up variations of the original 10-point declaration. In Melbourne or locally in Australia, the movement was encouraged by the UK's initiative and a disappointment with the lack of climate action here. A small group of architects launched the Australian Architects Declare movement in July 2019, and we have about 950 signatories, and we have about 1,000 supporters to our group. Our supporters include architects, landscape architects, engineers, builders, planners, all some of whom have launched their own DECLARE campaign. Our group meets every fortnight and we consider policy actions. I might go to another slide, just so you've got something to look at. Um, which talks about regenerative design, communication, uh, advocacy campaigns. We've met with architects overseas. Um, we've connected with architecture, sorry, 2030, uh, Architecture 2030, the RIBA, as well as being involved with the um, AIA in relation to their sustainability um, policies. We've made submissions to the AACA on national competency and we've been running webinars that have been um, well supported both locally and with international participants. So in about 18 months we've done quite a lot but we're far from content with what has been done. Um, because we believe that we need to be a really strong voice for reducing emissions. The built environment, more or less, represents about 40% of carbon emissions, which means that the built environment could become 40% of the solution. So in today's talk, I've been asked to address two questions. What does the current pandemic emergency tell us about how we face the... Sorry, how does the current pandemic emergency tell us about uh, the climate and biodiversity crisis and what lessons can be learned from this um, unprecedented response. So we are in the midst of a pandemic and last year saw unprecedented extremes with the summer bushfire season, um, Black Lives Matter, economic hardship and the dramatic and unnerving, I might go to the next slide, um, 
unnerving scenes coming out of the US under the Trump presidency. The idea that the current crisis is exceptional doesn't recognise the many difficult situations that we've faced in previous generations. Pandemics are not new, in fact they were predicted. Disasters, famines, wars and displacement are all part of human history. The reality is that action on climate change is really up to us. From a personal point of view, there might be a metaphysical connection between all the issues that we confronted in 2020. Well, perhaps the importance of climate change has been overshadowed by the immediacy of everything else. To be honest, I don't really know, but what I do worry about is that climate change and loss of diversity has been sidelined by other issues. Or well, that there seems to be a conflation of seemingly unrelated issues when trying to work out what to do. The sort of hugeness of the problem is really confronting and frankly, I'm just as likely to tune out and when I should really be doing more. I genuinely worry that climate change has been over-intellectualised and that we, are, we sort of marvel at our own genius in the way that we analyse things when really all I want is for our children to enjoy the natural beauty of the Great Barrier Reef. Time is running out and action is needed if we're to avert the more dramatic changes of global warming. We have to be careful not to confuse issues and to remain focused on reducing carbon emissions, which seems to be the only way that we can um, limit the impact of climate change. Nonetheless, I do acknowledge that this requires systemic change and a discussion around a wide range of issues. So on the one hand, everything is connected and the way forward is complex Yet the solution is simple. We have to stop polluting the planet with dangerous gases and start rebuilding in a way that is responsive to nature and the environment. So the current pandemic is, is, different, to, is different from the climate and biodiversity crisis, but there are lessons that we can learn. I recall the Chief Health Officer explained that COVID-19 only has one way to infected people, and that is by close proximity. Sorry, that should be before, but anyway. Um, the clear articulation of how the virus works helped me understand the problem, and understanding the problem helped me appreciate the response, and it helped me tune out the voices that were wanting to see the economy opened up in Victoria. In Victoria, we saw the restriction of personal freedoms to ensure the community remains safe and secure. The cooperation of many an inclusive approach, as we, as we saw, sorry, we know that the virus doesn't discriminate between age, gender, affluence, colour or race. We saw lessons in a clear and inclusive leadership when Daniel Andrews fronted the media over 100 days. This had an immeasurable benefit to the community in combating the virus. We saw that small actions such as per better personal hygiene, mask wearing, were critical to our our recent success. These lessons are important and demonstrate what can be done when we work together. So what did we learn? To overcome cha challenges, we need to keep things simple. We need to be clear about the threat and we need to explain it. We need to not be distracted and we need to be inclusive. We have to accept that we get things wrong and we need to explain the problem really clearly. We need to explain that individual actions matter. Things like, for instance, with climate change, riding to work, changing energy supplies and so forth. The pandemic taught us that we love using numbers, diagrams, graphs, maps, and to explain the crisis and that we reveled in the, the collective success of reducing the numbers. There's something of a bit of a sports mentality to all of this, which in my view, there's nothing wrong with this. So what are the lessons from this unprecedented response? In my view, architects declare is a movement with a singular focus. It's to highlight the need to bring about action. There is no one group or one person that can make the wholesale, wholesale changes that are needed to, to make the changes that are required, be it a business, a, an individual, or a practice. Advocacy remains the most important aspect we at Architects Declare are, are part of, and I'm personally committed to seeing this advocacy role grow. My view is that if every architect does the right thing and we do everything we possibly can, 
we will still have a climate change and a biodiversity threat. So we need leadership. And in my view, we need, um, we need national leadership. Because in my view, the state and local leaders seem to be doing what they need to to bring about change. In my view, the, the way forward is twofold. As architects, we need to do more personally and professionally, and we need architects declare to be a voice for architects and built design professionals to lobby local and federal governments and state governments to improve their policies around climate change. We learned from the extraordinary pandemic response that those leaders who put, leader, those leaders who put people first must be listened to and supported. Those who put ideology and the economy ahead of people and the planet must be challenged. Sorry, I'll go back on. It's not a left versus right issue, which is what has, seems to be becoming. There are many good conservative leaders who recognise the threat and act according to the science. People like John Hewson, Cathy McGowan and others are conservative leaders who don't see action, climate change as a partisan issue. Indeed, it's been the independent, more conservative voices like Zali Stegall who have been challenging the conservative voices like Tony Abbott and giving a sensible voice to this issue. So in terms of what I envisage for architects to Clare is that we need to find voices on both sides of the political spectrum to face this issue. We don't need to work along partisan lines because we're talking about a threat to our own existence. The solution needs to be based on good science and good management. We can't be driven by people like Andrew Bolt, Alan Jones and Peter Crendlin who are taking up space in this, in this area and they don't appreciate the problem or entertain the solution. So to conclude, Australia has been at the forefront of many important issues in the past. And it's a real shame that we're lagging behind this particular issue on a global sense. In my view, Architects Declare is well placed to be a single issue movement, to act behalf, on behalf of architects and the built environment professionals, to be a voice of change across the political divide. Leadership, national leadership, hopefully, will make our work a lot easier. We saw that with the pandemic. We saw that leadership actually made a difference to individuals, to companies, to a whole range of people. So we can strengthen the, the really good work that many, many architects are doing and built, built environment professionals are engaged with. So I just thought I'd conclude on this little note that now more than ever, ever we do need to commit to hope and the power of the individual and collective action for the good of all. You are the reason for hope. Thank you. Um, there's a bit of change in plans. You're going to see a preview of my slides and then we'll come back to it, okay? Testing, testing. Okay. Good morning. My name is Esther Charlesworth and I'm a professor of architecture and urban design at RMIT and the founder of Architects Without Frontiers, or what I'll call today, AWF. So our mission at AWF is to improve the built environment of communities in need. We facilitate the design and construction of health, education and Disaster Management Planning, sorry. Um, we facilitate the design and construction of health education and community projects across Australia and the Asia Pacific region. And over the last two decades, AWF has helped transform the lives of around 5,000 people over 13 countries in four main ways. We've first of all, designed and helped build 46 health and education projects 
collaborated with 35 communities to improve their social and physical infrastructure and partnered with 12 Australian built environment firms in delivering pro bono design services, including Tract, Hassel, SJB and JCB Architects, to undertake projects um, as diverse as a women's crisis centre in Northcote to an orphanage in Kabul in Afghanistan. In my day job at RMIT, so I'm a voluntary director at Architects Without Frontiers, um, in my day job at RMIT, I run the Master of Disaster Design and Development degree, or the MOD degree, where I work with similar objectives in trying to train the next generation of thinkers and designers who want to transition their careers into the disaster development and resilience sectors um, and have sort of want training or understanding about how design and systems thinking can address the classic wicked problems of our time. So, our graduates, sorry, I'm just giving a bit of a plug for the degree, have ended up in diverse positions upon graduation with the World Bank, with the um, GADPOD, that's gender and development, um, to one of my um, students who graduated four years ago is now doing camp planning for refugees um, in Bangladesh. So, onto the topic, what does the current pandemic emergency tell us about how we can face the climate and biodiversity crisis? I see that we're now confronted by the increasing spectacle of widespread disasters compounded by pandemics, eco ecological vulnerability and social fragility. And my big interest as both a design practitioner and as an educator is what is the role of designers amidst such global flux? And after having lived and worked in um, conflict zones from Bosnia to Beirut over the last 20 years, um, I reflect that the demand is now more urgent than ever for built environment professionals to respond to the challenges of rebuilding cities and landscapes affected and often destroyed by the combination of conflict, sea level rise, political instability, social inequality, poverty and disease. I just read yesterday that one in every 97 people on the planet was forced to flee their homes by the end of 2019, which was, I thought was a pretty stunning statistic. And with COVID, these numbers have only increased. And my interest is, is of course, the sticky problems, the wicked problems of our time. You can somehow feel helpless. What do you do about it? But these political health and social vulnerabilities all have spatial implications. We're always in crisis, so many communities, and COVID has just accelerated this. The people who have lost out are the people on the margins, typically not architecture's main clientele, or as Cynthia Smith talks about in her book, The Other 90%. People now living in their cars that I've spoken to from Rosebud to Noosa, to Rohingya refugees living on mud flats in Bangladesh. So what lessons from this unprecedented times can be applied to our advocacy and action? And I guess in my experience, having run a not-for-profit for 20 years, activism is great, but how do we change policy settings? Get architects, landscape architects, whoever, on the table at major organisations, such as Building Victoria's Recovery Task Force or the National Bushfires bushfire recovery agency because we're simply not there at a structural level to perhaps create the change that Antony so eloquently spoke about. And my advice is be very clear about what your agenda is as an individual and as an organisation. Can you only do it with volunteer staff because I found that that became impossible. What are models for success we can look to? And my model has been the Mass Design Group who some of you might be aware of in the USA. Um, and people like Mass who are thinking, working and designing in crisis zones beset by poverty, social marginalisation, which COVID has just accelerated. Mass design, as we see here on this slide, stands for a model of architecture serving society. And Mass are known for their public health expertise, but also a really interesting tripartite design and business model of for-profit, not-for-profit and research. So, and I'm just going to touch on two projects today because I think projects are the best way to perhaps 
describe some points here. So this is a maternity, maternity waiting village project they did in Malawi, where Mass worked with doctors, nurses, public health expertise, experts and expectant mothers at the facility to propose a new prototype for this waiting village. And what I'm most interested about, of course, it's an award-winning project. It's, it's beautiful. It's sort of mass are all over the New York Times. They're superstars in the US, and I'm not so interested in that. But the post-occupancy studies of the project, the evidence, have demonstrated that this new village prototype has reduced both maternal and infant mortality, reduced the spread of disease through simple design elements of external and external courtyards, and increased family income and well-being. So if you're not leveraging a livelihood through doing these development projects, I think you have to ask, what are you doing? So in summary, Mass Group's ability to build an architecture of evidence is not mutually exclusive of an architecture of excellence. And evidence-based design, like evidence-based medicine, as we've seen highlighted very much last year through the rise of public health professionals as the public intellectuals of our time, Evidence-based design is not just reserved for engineering, medicine or science. Too many lives, as we see in this project, frankly, depend on it. And regarding the pandemic, Michael Murphy, who the, who's the CEO of the Mass Group, has said, in each of these previous epidemic space mattered, buildings play an outside, outsized role in the spread of infection and redesign efforts played a key role in stemming the tide of a pandemic. Whether it's providing ample, clean airflow to the increase the presence of contagion, building effective systems to separate waste from water, or designing spaces conducive to infection control, architecture can and must play its part to face pandemics. So the second project before I wrap up is the Kaldachov Women's Resource Centre, or the Al Tadja Dreaming Project in Sabu Sabu, Fiji, that Architects Without Frontiers have done in partnership with the local women. Now this project, why I'm, I'm bringing it here, um, apart from it being a fantastic pro project with fantastic women with a fantastic, fantastic view, exemplifies a chaotic series of factors that 2020 has now normalised. From Cyclone Winston five or six years ago to health challenges, to embezzlement by the local admin officer who then burnt down the project office, to then the global, global pandemic. Um, all of these projects have materialised um, in this building. And in Fiji, with the closure of state borders and ships ceasing to sail because of the pandemic, Fiji's supply chain have, has been disrupted and food insecurity has been increased. Displaced individuals and households are becoming refugees of the crisis. So this project, as I said, ex exemplifies, I think, this point that we're at now, dealing with so many inherent fragilities a lack of land tenure, a deeply patriarchal society. And this project is sited within a Pacific locale that has one of the highest levels of domestic violence in the Pacific. So in fact, the women use this project, or sorry, use this building as a refuge rather than going to the local police station. So the building is much more than a community centre per se. It's a women's refuge, a business and craft trading floor a hybrid and multitasking building that may become more of the norm post-pandemic. So wrapping up, and decades after my first immersion into cities divided by conflict, again, we might ask, while well, the current disaster of pandemics, sea level rise, poverty, fires, floods and typhoons concern us in the design profession. Because we're human, because great architecture can work with complex issues and disciplines in often a mediating role. That poverty does not exclude aesthetics. If we distance ourselves and our spatial practices from the big challenges of our time with, I'm just an architect, we become part of the problem. It's not always a question of where are your ethics, but where is your humanity? And to begin this existential change in the design professions, I believe the pivotal place is to start is with design education. And in, as an example, this fall, the Tulane School of Architecture in New Orleans became the first design school in North America to sign on to the US Architects Declare initiative. This, this body like, is led by people like Anthony, a vanguard of domestic practitioners who have sought to recenter the profession in recognition of parallel crises in climate change, biodiversity, and social justice. 
and their professorate, Tulane, Jesse Keenan has commented. Architects are not expected to be climate scientists, but they are going to be held to an evolving standard of care that requires a regional and site-specific ascertainment of a wide range of climate change impacts, from flooding to extreme heat. It's no longer su sufficient to believe that professional ethics or a greater awareness of climate change will have any meaningful impact on the status quo. Architects need substantive knowledge and skills to address climate change. At the Ch Tulane School of Architecture, we're going to change the way we educate tomorrow's climate leaders. One architect, one building, and one community at a time. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, thanks for being here on a Saturday morning and thanks for all of the great panel speakers who shared their thoughts. Um, my name is Targol, I'm the Vice President of Architects for Peace. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, um, Architects for Peace is a not-for-profit organization for landscape architects, architects, urban designers, urban planners who seek um, social justice, solidarity, and peace in the built environment. The organization started in 2003 in Melbourne as a response to Australian government involvement in the war and bombing of Iraq, and uh, we were kind of opposing that, and we um, we're trying to promote a dialogue as the way moving forward to respond to conflict and a way to um, um, overcome issues rather than going to the war. Um, so in 2003, the organization started and the intention was to have an international forum of the professionals to get together and to provide a platform to share um, editorials, events, and uh, free dialogue about the issues that are important. For those of you who know the organization maybe from 15, 16 years ago, words at Building 50 might be familiar. It was the series of talks that we held at RMIT Building 50, and it covered a lot of topics um, that were fresh and new at that time because there was never a discussion about these topics in our profession, the value of um, social justice, equality. And then as we move forward, we had more and more um, graduates showing interest to join the organization and we saw that there is an opportunity to provide that missing conversation that is also missing in our educational system about these values because we never talk about these things or we hardly talk about these things when we are um, in architecture school. It's all about um, design and combination and composition, which are all good and fair, but then there are other things that we can also think about as architects and people who work in the profession. So Architects for Peace, provided that platform for professionals, for academics, and for graduates to come together and talk about this. Um, in keeping up with the discussions about uh, public space uh, and moving to 2020, um, we wanted to continue our discussion about how we can have an impact on public space. In fact, we had uh, a couple of years ago one of our uh, first events at M Pavilion, which was about um, the importance of democratic public spaces. And um, in that event, we were talking about the importance of public spaces. And in 2020, I think it was more obvious the value and importance of public spaces and how people use it. In 2020, before the pandemic, we were thinking about having this projection project of projecting different images to different public buildings, going through what happened to all of us in 2020, that even moved to an online platform and a competition, and we called for a competition for um, projection illustration on Richmond Town Hall at City of Yara. And the image that you see on the screen is from the winning um, uh, entry, which is called Regeneration by Mirana. And the idea is the flowers blooming from 
the microscopic image of the coronavirus, and we, we thought it was a beautiful representation of hope, of the importance of nature, and also kind of emphasizing, as Anthony was saying, the important role of government and leadership at the time of crisis. Going to the main questions of what does the current pandemic emergency tell us about how we can face the climate and biodiversity crisis, the most important lesson for us is that we can change. And I think we've all experienced it one way or another last year. Um, at Architects for Peace, like many other organizations, like many other professions, we moved to an online platform. Whether we are coming from an academic background that we had to run the studios online, or for us, running um, um, the Ethical CERN, which was a forum as part of COP25 UN, moving the whole um, forum to an online platform, or as practitioners that we uh, realized how the coronavirus had an impact on our job and the way we design uh, or move forward in designing different spaces. I think we all learned that we can change. But I think my point here is that um, we knew that the pandemic was coming, and I think I'm not sure Anthony mentioned that. We knew that the pandemic is coming, and we knew that this is going to happen. But we kind of tried to ignore it, and it was maybe coming from the leadership from US for the last four years. It was trying to totally ignore the science. So what happened was that when the pandemic happened, we were not ready for it. No one was ready for it. We didn't have a booklet or guideline to tell us, hey, this is real and this is happening to all of us. This is how we need to reply to it. And this is how we need to respond. We didn't have that. However, we tried our best to adjust and we quickly tried to change. Uh, with the climate crisis, it's the same. We know that it is coming. We know that it is happening. The evidence is there, but we are trying to ignore it and we are taking baby steps which are not enough. If there is one thing that last year and the pandemic showed us, it's that we can change and the changes can be and should be bold. We stopped the Olympics. Did any one of us thought in 2018 that we can stop the Olympics? It was like, no, maybe you can try promoting using recyclable coffee cups in the Olympics, but you can't stop the Olympics. So what I'm trying to say is that when the issue and the threat is real, is real, the response should be real and bold as well. Look at the images of the flight movement in March 2019 compared to March 2020. We stopped flying. We realized that we don't need to necessarily travel to another country or another city to, have, to attend a one-hour meeting, and that was unbelievable in 2018. Who does that? Like, we have to obviously travel and go to another city because we have a one-hour catch-up. Well, we changed. We had to change. That was because of pandemic. We don't need to get to the same point with the climate crisis that we are not ready and we have to suddenly stop everything. So we can change. We have to change. Let's change and let's be more bold and strong in changes that we accept and we demand from our government and politicians. The second question is about the lessons from this um, unprecedented response. I think the lesson for us was that inequality can't be ignored. And we see inequality everywhere. We realize that the way our neighbors live, the way people in our community live, the way people in our apartment block live, it can have an impact on us and our, in our health and well-being. We realize that the design of public space and the way we use public space and have access to public space is important. Having square villages or city centers that are close to our home and we can actually go there for our local shopping, it's important. So all of these things that are provided to us, uh, if it's outcome of a good design, it is important, and if it's not, because it's the re reflective of inequalities that are everywhere in our cities, we could see it stronger and bolder during the pandemic. We were asked to stay home as if everyone has a home to stay. It seemed to be a very simple message, just to stay home. Well, for a short time, I think the government realized that, well, there are people who are homeless and we have to think about them. Well, there you go, there are real issues. 
And I think all of the people who care enough about this subject to be here on a sun Saturday morning, they all know that not all the homeless people are in the streets. We all know that majority of homeless people are those who are living in overcrowded, uh, very, very um, unhealthy environments, small apartment blocks. So again, another inequality that came to surface was that first of all, not everyone has a place called home to stay. And second of all, even if we are asking people to stay home, some of us have big mansions with big backyards and ocean views. Some other have places that don't even have a balcony. So it's again, not an equal system. And it's not fair to ask people to stay home when they don't even have access to sunlight and balcony. So decent housing matters. Not only housing matters, but also decent housing matters. And it's important to provide at least the minimum requirements for people to have access to a decent house, not just something to call home, not just something that has 10 other people sharing one room, something that's decent and respectful. Um, I really like this quote by Melinda Gates, which talks about the pandemic and it bringing, it, uh, bringing to surface all the um, society, uh, racism inequalities that we have in our societies, like um, systematic racism, gender inequality, and poverty. Um, one other thing that we know and we have seen in the past is that um, pandemics are not new. They are part of how we evolve in our cities. We know that compact city living may create an environment for disease to grow faster. We have seen that in Chloro. And in, actually, in response to that in 19th century cities, there has been a big change in sanitary, in healthcare system, and in city planning policies. But then again, we can see that those uh, responses they haven't been um, shared equally in all parts of the cities. It seems like those who are coming from marginalized communities and the urban poor, they are not getting the same um, share of urban policies in terms of creating a healthy and a clean environment to live. We all know that there are still places, um, suburbs and um, cities around the world that people don't have access to clean water, toilet, basic things that we think at least after chloro should have been provided in all cities. So in response to this pandemic, I hope that when we, came, when we come out of this and when we are trying to rethink about our cities, we try to create a better environment for everyone, not just again for people who are on top of the list. And as a way to show how I see inequality, even in the way the media covers the pandemic, uh, we can see daily number of coronaviruses of um, cities like London and New York. But if you want to see what's happening in a refugee camp, you have to search. And even if you search, you may not exactly find an up-to-date information. These people are in refugee camps because the war forced them to move from their country. And now they are in a refugee camp, we are in a pandemic, and again, we are focusing on big cities and we don't even care enough about what's happening there. I'm not saying that nothing is happening. I'm sure there are lots of not-for-profit organizations who are really trying their best, but maybe it's not enough. If it's not in the media, if we don't care about it, then it means that we are, again, as a systematic approach, we are ignoring what's happening in the areas that are disadvantaged. But there is hope. We don't want to be very negative on a Saturday morning. There is hope. And the hope is shown by this image from my lovely colleague Eva from Sydney in Newton. Um, this is in the middle of when people were rushing into supermarkets because obviously it was the end of the world. And if you couldn't find your toilet paper, well, God knows what can happen to you. So in the middle of that, people were putting um, everything that they didn't need in these boxes in the streets for others to use. So what I'm trying to say is that, in general, I think there is hope. I think people are trying and they want to do their best. But let's try to put our effort that this time, when we are responding to this pandemic and when we are coming out of this pandemic, our approach is more equal and we are trying to create a better world for all. Thank you. <laughs> Basic, sorry, this basically concludes um, 
our talk today. So we're just, uh, yeah. So if you have any question, we want to thank you for all coming, understanding as well with the new restrictions. Um, probably a lot of people couldn't make it today because of the new restriction. So yes, please, I put it now for the audience. If you have any questions, any comments you would like to add. Um, just thank you for a great talk, but I've also just got a general question and also if you have any advice for how an architecture student um, could go about helping or addressing any of these issues or informing myself and educating myself on these sort of things. You can, uh, there's actually Tom today here, who's the vice president of SONA, um, who actually maybe he should answer this question. I think you should really probably join the Sustainable Architecture Forum in the Institute, probably join other Architect for Peace, look as well at Architect Declare and what Architect Without Frontier is doing. I couldn't hear the last part of your question because of your mask, but um, yeah, there's a lot that students can do and can be involved. Maybe, Tom, you can talk quickly on Sona. Do you want to pass him, sorry, the microphone? Can I just make a comment, Nadine? Yes, yeah, yeah. And yeah, because, yes, as well, she has to go. My experience, um, the best thing you can do is build your capacity and your skills as a great architect and then skills in urban resilience and other things. Unfortunately, we found at the start of our organisation that involving students or architects with sort of small businesses became a crisis for them and a crisis for us. Um, businesses went under because students were working on volunteer projects and with marginalised communities, we feel that they deserve the same level of design expertise and professionalism as a normal client. So I think it's great to have an interest, um, but if you really want to direct your career um, in this area, the best thing you can do is be a great architect to start with um, and then develop those kind of other skills on top of it because typically my friends, I've got a, a Melbourne architect friend who is the Chief of Sh Shelter and Settlements for UNHCR. He's a ostensibly the world's largest urban designer. He manages 350 camps, kind of 4 million people. He gets... 100 emails a week. I'm not saying that you want to work for UNHCR, by the way. Um, I want to work. I'm a student. I'm a graduate. And I can tell you where most of the emails head to his delete bin. So it's the students or graduates who have a second language, who have experience in construction management, project management, um, have already worked in a volunteer operation. So it's so sort of hard yards. Interest is great, but sort of capacity and skills is sort of essential. And unfortunately, I think design education, because of the nature of it, will always be sort of extremely limited in what you can do in a three plus two degree. So that's my two cents worth. Sorry, I interrupted. No, or, uh, perhaps if I, can I, um, oh, sorry. Um, I would also like to add that not to forget that you are a person as well, that you're, you have your architectural career and that you are a human being and that you actually have a lot of choices that you can make as a consumer, who you vote for, what you actually participate as an individual, whether it's, you know, being friends with the Merry Creek or, or whatever. And I think we underestimate just what we can do as uh, individuals. We, architecture is a really important role but there is a whole range of other things that you can be engaged with that can actually change things that can actually then also influence your, your um, architectural career. So, you know, please don't forget that there's a whole... You've got economic power, you're a person, you're articulate, and all those things can actually contribute quite meaningful, meaningfully to this as well. Tom? Um, and, yeah, just on the, uh, the AIA and SONA front, I know, so Victoria, we already have the sustainability uh, forum, which I think we could ta chat to uh, Nadine a bit later about potentially how students can be more involved or added to the emailing list and stuff. But um, in addition to that, uh, nationally this year, we're going to try and start a student-run sustainability forum uh, where to get input from basically unis around the country and inform 
sort of what we as students want to present to the institute as uh, you know uh, things we'd like to do regarding climate change and sustainability. Um, so there's a few things going on. Um, not all of them have started yet, but yeah, just kind of keep your ears open and um, talk to your fellow students and organise if you want to start something at your uni, like a group um, focused on pushing these issues. I'd recommend you do that, and but also yeah, be in contact with other students because there's there's stuff going on. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Any other questions or comments? You don't have to ask. You can just comment if you want or add something. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Gina is part of our rewilding community group. And like Tom said sometimes, and, and actually Anthony, uh, it's not just about being an architect. It's actually being really involved in local matters and being part of local groups and, um, you know, engage, engage, connect. That's what's really important. So if there's no more questions, I would like to thank you all. Thank you so much for coming. And, um, yeah, and hopefully we'll see you in other events. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.